Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the president of San Jose State University, Mary Papazian. Thank you, Stefan. It is an honor to be introduced by a fellow Bruin, so, so thank you. Let me also acknowledge and thank Associated Students President Ariadna Manzo, who, as you heard, uh, is in class right now doing what students are here to do. Uh, but I had the pleasure of watching her in front of 16 orientations. She was at all 16. I wasn't quite at that many, and she was extraordinary. So I know, students, you are in for a great year. And good afternoon and welcome to all of you. I am heartened to see you here, and to those of you who are watching uh, on, on the live stream, thank you for joining us. It is a beautiful day in San Jose, and I wish you could join us in person. I also wish that I could jump right into my prepared remarks, but in the aftermath of recent national and international events, I just can't. And I just want to take uh, just a brief moment to, uh, to just speak to those events. What unfolded two weekends ago in Charlottesville and uh, is very much uh, unfolding in different ways in different parts of our country was jarring to the eyes and searing to the soul. We were reminded that human decency remains under attack by forces seeking to rip apart the fabric of respect and inclusivity that bonds civil societies. I reject the notion advanced by some that the protest at the University of Virginia was about preserving historical artifacts or even First Amendment rights. Our values compel us to protect the constitutional right of all community members to express views that may be hurtful or even repugnant to others. But our values also compel us to reject discrimination and hatred, especially when it is cloaked in the false equivalence of political disagreement. The California ACLU said it pretty well in a statement last week. White supremacist violence is not free speech. Violence is not speech. Today, I want to assure you that we stand with the University of Virginia, the people of Charlottesville, and all communities in renouncing bigotry, racism, and religious intolerance. It is a time of such dispiriting divisiveness let us all unite around our shared values, which include creating space for spirited and difficult conversations and respecting diverse views and perspectives. I know we are up to the challenge. And now back to the script. I have to say, the summer flew by. Weren't we just together on Tower Lawn for an investiture? That was 16 weeks ago. 52 weeks ago today, we gathered in this ballroom for my first fall welcome address as your president. That was also the first opportunity for many of you to meet my husband, Dennis, who is with us today. Dennis, just stand up and wave. And some of you have met our daughters, Ani and Marie. Now, Ani remains on the East Coast, working at Mass General Hospital in Boston while applying to med schools. But Marie is with us today. Uh, Marie, why don't you stand and wave, too? And it's great, it's great to have you here, because this actually is something of a poignant moment for our family. Dennis and I are soon to be empty nesters, like so many of the parents who joined us this weekend dropping off their children here at San Jose State. In fact, Marie and I will be leaving tomorrow morning for New York City, where she will begin her college career as a freshman next week. And while that, you, you can congratulate her. We're very proud of her. And while that is somewhat bittersweet for us as parents, it makes the issues we will discuss today much less abstract. When we talk about student success, we are talking about real people, our sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, guardians and friends. And so we celebrate the start of a new academic year 
mindful of the values that have served this university as its North Star for 160 years. Intellectual curiosity, integrity, tireless devotion to students. Think for a moment about this, 160 years. That's a lot of tradition, many milestones, and so much promise. And whether you are a faculty member or a staff member, a development officer or a police officer, please remember we are part of something larger than ourselves. We are the stewards of San Jose State's legacy and the guardians of its future. And it continues to amaze me the wonder of a daughter of immigrants, a humanist, a scholar of English literature leading the public university in the epicenter of the tech universe. You guys laugh. See, they laugh. They laugh, yeah. English and engineering, poetry and particle science, John Donne and Steve Jobs. Now, what do they have to do with each other? Some of you may say not very much, but, but I always like something that's different. This afternoon, I hope you will come to see that the keys to our future sit squarely at those intersections and others like them. I also hope you will come to see that this future is very much in the present. 2030, 2040, those dates once seemed so far away, didn't they? But today, they are just around the corner. Now think of it for a minute. And the reality that the children born this year will be 83 at the turn of the next century in 2100, the 22nd century. And with the advances in medicine we see every day, they most likely will be a very healthy 83-year-old. Imagine what they will see in their lifetime, what they will see as they move from elementary to middle and high school, and finally reach us at San Jose State 18 years from now. And when will that be? In 2035. They will be the class of 2039. As I said, the future is very much upon us. And with this broader framework, I would like us to cast our eyes outward at what is happening beyond our campus borders. It is neither wise nor productive to live or plan in a vacuum. And so my hope today is to launch a dialogue about the inevitability of change and what it can mean to embrace change. I want to begin to outline a roadmap for strategic planning and other priorities for the year ahead. And I want to ask us to imagine a 21st century curriculum that taps into the minds and hearts of all of our students. And let me start by saying that after a year as your president, I am more confident than ever that with open minds and willing hearts, there is little we can't do. We can transform the lives and destinies of our students. We can help power the reinvention of our valley. We have been doing this and much more for our long history. And so we begin this academic year with some wind at our backs. We have welcomed, as you heard, our largest ever class of first year and transfer students, more than 9,000 strong. And with an estimated 15,000 students living within three miles of campus, we assuredly are not a commuter school anymore. Let there be no doubt, San Jose State is a destination campus. Thanks to all of you. We expect to add 55 tenure and tenure track faculty positions this year in the wake of 187 successful recruitments since 2014, the largest in the CSU. And as a result, our tenure density, a measure of academic quality, is slowly rising. Having attracted more than $73 million in private gifts and commitments since 2015, we are ready to intensify planning for our next comprehensive campaign. And just this week, we announced a commitment of $2.5 million from alumna Gloria Chang and her husband Michael 
to endow need-based scholarships for business students and fund other career planning programs. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Four and six year graduation rates are rising. We have been recognized as one of America's top universities for fueling the upward economic and social mobility of our students. The Sierra Club this week ranked San Jose State among the nation's 50 most sustainable universities. We officially are a cool school, and we need that branding out there. With the development of our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, we are better equipped to embrace the true meaning of diversity and inclusion. We continue to deepen relationships in local, state, and federal government and forge connections with industry, public policy, and nonprofit partners. I'm reminded of something Steve Jobs said, great things never are done by one person, they're done by teams. We are a good team and a big team with nearly 35,000 students, 5,000 faculty and staff members, 270,000 living alum and countless friends. Let us take a moment to acknowledge our team. Big round of applause for all of you. Now, class schedules make it hard for students and faculty members to break away for this address. But I would like any students with us today to stand so we can welcome you and express our appreciation. You are why we are here. So students, please stand. Thank you. I would also like to invite faculty in attendance to stand and remain standing for a moment. So all faculty. <laughs> and if you are among the 63 new faculty members joining us this fall, would you wave so we can give you a special Spartan welcome? Some of our new faculty. <laughs> welcome. Without a dedicated staff, not much gets done. So I would like to invite all staff members in attendance to stand. Staff, please stand. And if you have joined San Jose State since August, if you don't mind waving so we know who you are and can thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. And let me now introduce our newest academic and administrative leaders. And please hold your applause until I've finished. First, the Don Beale Dean of the Davidson College of Engineering, Dr. Cheryl Ehrman. Cheryl comes to San Jose State from the University of Maryland. Next, the Dean of the Lucas College and Graduate School of Business, Dr. Dan Mashavi. For Dan, this is a homecoming. He was a San Jose State faculty member in the late 2000s. Cheryl, welcome. And Dan, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> Two members of the President's Cabinet have joined our community since last fall. Vice President for Organizational Development and Chief of Staff, Jay Bailey, arrived here from Connecticut last October. Jay qualifies as a newcomer, even though her one-year anniversary is less than two months away. And Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer, Bob Lim, joined us just eight weeks ago. Bob most recently served at the University of Kansas and in the Texas Public University system, but he has deep roots in the Bay Area and attended San Francisco State. And I'm pleased also to welcome Marie Tuitt in her new role as Director of Intercollegiate Athletics. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I would like the rest of the cabinet to stand for just a moment. Just the rest of you, if you don't mind, just for a minute. I see you up here in front. I'm grateful to this group for its leadership and commitment. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and if I could ask uh, Dr. Reggie Blaylock to remain standing, I'd appreciate it. You just heard that Reggie, and some of you know, Reggie recently announced that he will be leaving San Jose State this fall 
to return with his family to his hometown of San Diego. Reggie and his wife Felicia both have immediate and extended family there, and one of their daughters is a second year student at San Diego State. As our Vice President for Student Affairs since 2015, Reggie has tackled his work with the same determination, boundless energy, and infectious enthusiasm that made him a star student athlete. Reggie, we thank you for your unwavering commitment to students and the many ways you have enhanced our capacity to serve them. You always will be part of the Spartan family. Thank you so much. So as we begin our 161st year, what is happening beyond our campus borders that might inform our own work? According to author Thomas Friedman, society is in the midst of a second renaissance, driven by curiosity and imagination, and accelerated by the power of technology. The evidence is all around us. Driverless cars, robots that may have figured out how to communicate with each other, Smartphones that we use an average of 85 times a day, at least that's what TechCrunch thinks. I actually think it's probably higher. Some of you might be using it now. <laughs> nah, you wouldn't be. Wearable devices like the Apple Watch, um, and who knows what's around the bend. And speaking of Apple, my cabinet and I visited their Cupertino headquarters last week to see some of what they are doing in the education space and to share a bit about what is happening here. It was eye -pop an eye-popping reminder that operating at the speed of paper makes little sense when there are opportunities to move at the speed of innovation. And I was reminded of another observation from Thomas Friedman. There are two times to embrace change, now and later. Sitting squarely in the heart of Silicon Valley, it is hard to ignore the drumbeat of change. We hear it from leaders in tech, healthcare, education, business, the arts, and sports. And as the Valley's leading academic institution and its top source of college-educated talent, San Jose State is vital to the future of a region that is vital to the future of our society. And we hear the same thing from our friends in government. The city of San Jose is negotiating with Google to bring a mixed-use urban development to the area near the Derridon Transit Center, bringing as many as 20,000 jobs and associated economic development to town. City planners are figuring out how and where to integrate two BART stations, one of my favorite topics, into the center of our downtown. City and county leaders are struggling to address a serious housing shortage and a persistent house homeless crisis, and we experience the impacts of both every day. California will need another million to a million and a half college-educated workers by 2025, which is just around the corner, and policymakers are beseeching public universities to graduate more students in less time. Everywhere we turn, we hear the same thing. Please help us. And that is precisely what we should want to hear. So the question before us is this. Are we willing and ready to help reinvent our region? I am confident the answer is yes. And I would think it's an enthusiastic yes. And why would we not? It is our students who will help meet those workforce demands. And today's students are tomorrow's innovators. And preparing our students for these opportunities obliges us to reimagine how we educate and support them. So I want to just take a quick survey. If you studied the humanities, the social science, or the arts, please raise your hands. See, all the humanists come for, for us. Thank you. Now, now, uh, if you studied a STEM discipline, that is science, technology, engineering, or math, please raise your hands. Now another half of the room, thank you. So I like to read, I'm a literature professor, so I do a lot of reading, and this summer I read The Fuzzy and the Techie by Scott Hartley. It's a catchy title, but what does it really mean? 
The title refers to Common Vernacular at Stanford, where students in the humanities, arts, and soft sciences are fuzzies, and STEM students are techies. Now, Hartley was a fuzzy in a techie culture. He grew up in Palo Alto, studied political science at Stanford, and worked at Google and Facebook before going to grad school and later becoming a venture capitalist. Now, I'm a fuzzy too, which on its face might sound unflattering. But a question for the fuzzies here today, were you ever asked how you planned to use your degree? See some nodding heads. By a parent, perhaps? I know I was. Now, Huntley is, uh, Hartley has done just fine as a fuzzy. Today, he advises venture funds while serving on the Council of Foreign Relations. His book examines the impact and importance of soft skills instilled by the liberal arts on technology. And today, I want to focus on just a couple of his themes. First, Hartley argues that fuzzies are critical to unleashing the power of techie-inspired tools. He cites Steve Jobs' conviction, and you all know this one, Technolo technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, yields the results that make our hearts sing. Second, Hartley calls the traditional divide between STEM and the liberal arts a false dichotomy. And this was a similar theme in a conversation in which I participated through the Business Higher Education Forum in Washington, D.C. earlier this summer. He writes, the debate over STEM versus liberal arts has obscured the fact that the so-called pure sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, and math, are in fact a core component of the liberal arts canon. And computer science actually has been added to the canon as well. So students, he believes, can and should be exposed to both. Implied in this dichotomy is the notion, perhaps a hidden fear for some of us fuzzies, that the liberal arts aren't relevant to STEM education. And we hear so much about STEM education today and have no meaningful place in an innovation economy. But fuzzies take heart. As Hartley reminds us, LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman studied philosophy at Oxford, so there is something you can do with a philosophy major. <laughs> Pinterest founder Ben Silverman studied political science at Yale. The co-founder of Salesforce studied English literature. You know I'd find a way to slip that in. And former HP chief executive Carly Fiorina studied medieval history and philosophy. Hartley says, these tech exemplars are grounded in educations that taught methods of interrogation and rigorous thought, while many technology companies formed on the, these philosophies that are learned through liberal arts education. Now, he also cites a 2015 study suggesting that the fastest growth in high-skilled jobs is in professions demanding strong interpersonal skills, like nursing, and business management, and you can come up with a whole list. Hartley does not think that techies are less important than fuzzies, nor does he suggest that STEM students should switch to a fuzzy major, and neither do I. But he does urge universities, particularly as we hear all around us the need for STEM education, we also should embrace the liberal arts in preparing all students to thrive in an innovation-based economy and make hearts sing at work, at home, and in their communities. And so do I. And we know here at San Jose State how to do this. We have models all around us. I'm just going to mention a couple. Professor Craig Hobbs' Paseo prototyping work blends engineering and marketing. Professor Alejandro Garcia has shown the world how to apply the laws of physics to animation design. Professor Fritz Jambrock have, has applied packaging technology and supply chain management to the life-sustaining mission of delivering water where it is most desperately needed. Our simulation lab allows nursing students to engage in lifelike, hands-on patient instruction. And our general education requirements already include some immersion in the liberal arts. 
But based on what is happening around us, could we think about doing even more, and perhaps doing it more intentionally? How about a first year experience, student experience program that is steeped in the liberal arts? How about a senior year capstone project that demonstrates evidence of critical thinking, communication skills, and other forms of creative expression? And while we're at it, how about adding coding to all our majors? Might trust me, it's fun. Might steps like these help us prepare students to be both job ready and world ready? Now, vision and ideas abound. Sometimes my cabinet says I have too many of them, but they laugh. See, they laughed. But what else is possible? And what else might we do? There are many reasons to ask this of ourselves. Needs across our university exceed available resources. We are reliant on outdated, inefficient, cumbersome procedures and protocols. Too few students are completing their degrees on time, while too many face housing and food insecurity. Issues like these, as well as prior leadership turnover, may have left some of you dispirited or a little wary about the future. And I know that some of you may be unsettled by the prospect of change. But let me offer another view. Lupe Diaz Compion, for whom this student union is named, made an extraordinary $15 million gift to San Jose State. She told a university gathering a year ago that, quote, it's no big deal, you can do it too. Now, some misinterpret her to be saying that any of us could make an eight-figure gift. Of course, if you can do that, Please speak to me or Paul Lanning right away. <laughs> but in fact, that wasn't Lupe's point. She was trying to say that we all can support students and our mission in whatever ways inspire us. So today, I want to suggest that each of us can follow Lupe's lead by being open to change, to meaningful, enduring change. We are about to begin work, as you heard, on a new strategic plan. And some of you have heard me say that I believe we should look at a 10-year horizon, if not longer. And I'm well aware that the process by which the previous five-year plan was conceived left some of you dissatisfied. That said, this campus advanced significantly over the last five years. And I hope you will take a moment to look at the summary report that has been published online. And I hope we can all embrace the progress that was made and informed by lessons learned move forward. And let me tell you what we will have to do to ensure that these lessons aren't forgotten. We will gather on September 14 for a public strategic planning kickoff, followed shortly thereafter by a series of workshops that will provide input for further study. We will proceed with a sense of urgency, but we will not be rushed. This will be our journey, not a sprint. Our work will continue through the winter with a draft plan published next spring for community input. Co-chaired by Provost Andy Feinstein and Senate Chair Steph Frazier, the process will be guided by a campus steering committee and aided by an experienced facilitator. There will be many opportunities for campus and community input. We will be transparent, and inclusive. A website has been created where you will be able to monitor updates and track progress. But more than the planning itself, I am confident in our ability to make transformative changes in the best interests of our students, and I urge all of you to find as many ways to have your voice heard as we create the roadmap for the future. Now here's why I'm so confident. To me, Institutions are best positioned for change when their leaders reflect the characteristics and values of those they serve. We know that San Jose State is one of America's most diverse public universities, and one benchmark of diversity is gender equity. Now, many institutions in Silicon Valley struggle with this, as news coverage reminds us nearly every day. According to a report issued in 2015, 
Women held only 11% of executive positions in Silicon Valley. The numbers, numbers were comparable for CEOs. Two years later, little seems to have changed. This June, ride-sharing company Lyft issued a diversity report revealing that men occupied two-thirds of its executive and managerial positions. They aren't alone. The other day, I did an internet search using the phrase, gender equity in Silicon Valley. And what do you think I found? Well, the top result was a story in The Atlantic entitled, Why is Silicon Valley so awful to women? Well, I'm proud to say, I can't answer that one, but, but I am proud to say that things look quite different at Silicon Valley's public university. This year's Associated Student Board has 10 women and six men. And among the nine elected Academic Senate Executive Committee representatives, four are women and four are men. That only adds up to eight. I know you did the math. One seat is unfilled, so anybody, Seth, we need to try to fill that, don't we? Good public service announcement. And you might have noticed that our president's cabinet has five men and five women. Now, I do not believe that numbers alone prove anything. In fact, we know that diversity is measured by many factors other than gender. We also know that this campus at times has struggled with issues of diversity and inclusion. We should not pretend otherwise. But it is worth remembering that Associated Students Board members and Senate Executive Committee members were elected by their peers which suggests that our community values what each of us can contribute more than who we are. Now, I asked the President's Cabinet to invest a fair amount of time this summer thinking about its role in modeling, inspiring, and supporting change. Psychologist Carol Dweck has written about the role of personal mindsets in guiding how we think and act. There are, she says, two basic mindsets. A fixed mindset accepts things as they are and is wary of change. A 12-unit semester load is just fine, and the lack of on-campus housing for all students who need it is just the way it is. A growth mindset embraces challenges and won't settle for the status quo. Students can successfully take 15 semester units, and we should be aggressively exploring student housing options on and off campus. We should be doing the same, by the way, for our faculty and staff. In the year ahead, which path shall we choose? The status quo or the possible? As we ponder that, consider all there is for us to do this year. Building a student recreation and aquatic center, renovating our South Campus, and planning a science and innovation complex. Filling top leadership roles in three colleges and student affairs. Aligning our strengths in health, innovation, and related disciplines with the interests of our students and our region. Enhancing our capacity to support faculty and student involvement in research and other scholarly activities. Reimagining the student experience from recruitment through commencement and organizing ourselves accordingly. Continuing to reintroduce ourselves to the region through relationship building and strategic branding and marketing. Organizing ourselves more strategically to utilize information technology, transform our digital presence, and improve the wayfaring, wayfinding experience for campus visitors. Nurturing and strengthening a culture of civility and inclusion, more critical than ever in the current national climate. Joining Healthy Campus 2020, a national initiative that embraces the importance of health and wellness in supporting student success. And along the way, having some fun. How much more could we do for our students and our community? How much could we add to our rich legacy? This year, let's find out and let's enjoy the ride. Thank you very much.